thanks so much, uh, and thanks, Vladimir, for the opening. I agree with everything you said. So my presentation is really, does foresight work? And after 30 years of doing futures, I'm hoping you'll tell me the answer. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. Does it work? And if so, how? My own journey in foresight has always been to frame doing futures, theorizing futures, as a learning journey. And kind of level one of this is zero loop. You present information to a CEO, a minister, yourself, your kids, and they actually don't hear a word of it. So often my question is when you present data, why is it nonsensical to most people? If you have kids, you know exactly what I mean. You give them advice on the future, they don't hear a bit of it, right? So if you can't convince your five-year-old, what chance do you have with the prime minister? It's the same level of analysis. Uh, that's my experience. Yours may be different. Now, often the answer is what's called single loop learning, where you focus on one thing they can do differently. So CEOs ask me, that's interesting. What do I do differently Monday morning? So that's a single loop. Let me plan for it. Now, more and more we see that single loop doesn't work. Organizations, they see a problem. What they do, they hire experts. They put more money. They just work harder. And consistently, we see that fails. Now, why does it fail? Partly because they're not reflecting on who they are, and they're not reflecting on how the world changes. I presented to an educational system, and at the end of it, the newspaper wrote my article, and I said, you sh I recommend you do a meditation process to reduce bullying and increase happiness and IQ. And the newspaper reported, Anayatollah recommends heavy medication for children. <laughs> So I said, it's, I think that's a mistake. They said, no, no, you said medication. No, I said, I said meditation. And of course, then I understood. Their cognitive framework, their worldview could only hear data that made sense for them. So the only way out for me is to set up learning journeys in organizations, double loop, so the data they hear as they get confronted with the unknown, they have a framework that understands it. The way to get to that framework is the narrative. That's the underlying metaphor, the core story that caused the trauma. Maybe the reporter was in school and kids were noisy and she wants to medicate everyone. Something happened in her life where she has a framework that only certain data is accessible. So often, more and more, I try to find what is the core metaphor, change the story, change the framework, change what we do, then data makes sense. Now to do that, for me, I have to become, self, I have to become reflective. All of us as futurists, we walk in with our own biases. If we don't know that, we're in trouble straight away. We assume the world we see is the world that's out there. As all good futurists, then we try to challenge assumptions. Look, lady, you're the one who asked for a famous movie star with dark hair, strong nose, and deep set eyes. Now, clearly, she has certain assumptions about beauty, about humanness, about the role of science can deliver what it promises. Now, I presented this to a group of genetic engineers, and I apologize if you're one of them. And the head geneticist says, but there's nothing wrong with that slide. We just can't do it yet. <laughs> I said, so that's your big insight from challenging assumptions? They go, we have no assumptions. We have truth. OK, so problem found. This was a project on the year 3000 by a foundation that wanted to exist for 1,000 years. Heavily funded, they only would fund projects with a 1,000-year lifespan. This was their core imagination of the future. You may or may not like it, but certainly if you put on your critical Foucauldian hat, you can see the man's underneath the sun. You start with nature, nature disappears. So every imagination of the future has assumptions, and the role of the future is, is always to challenge those. This, this is an alternative imagination, built on the indigenous, built on nature, with the spirit, with technology, different assumptions there as well. So these imaginations help us think what might be the future, and we need to transform them. But our act of transformation, we of course have to do something. In this case, the artist is drawing, but maybe there's something else he could be doing. You know, what is that? It's pretty obvious. You know, help the person about to kick out. So of course, we have to see the world differently. To rethink up and down, vertical, horizontal, especially inside how we see the world. We have to see it from multiple perspectives. So I see foresight as an asset. Yes, prediction, yes, scenarios, yes, metaphor, but foundationally, it's an asset 
that I can use, others can use to enhance agency, our ability to influence the future. Now, that doesn't mean data is lost. This is not a critique of the US. Any country would do that, but as my teenage daughter told me many years ago, Dad, Joan and Noah never hooked up. Uh, I trust her expertise, and at least my understanding of science is that they never met. Now, there's reasons why people believe that, but let's save that for another day. Even with data, we know the future will be disruptive. When I was 23 years old, working with the justice system in the US, we had a grant money to write on the future, the legal rights of robots. And so we know robotics will keep on changing. We know there's a legal debate, should humans marry robots? We know 3D printing challenges manufacturing industries all over the world. We know the new social economy challenges capitalism, but we ask those questions, what does it mean? When I present to dairy producers, meat producers, if there's 3D printing of food, what happens to your industry? So futures we try to disrupt. One way to do that disruption is to think, well, how has the imagination of the future changed? If you go back over 100 years ago, if you were involved in politics, you could be put in a mental asylum. If you were over action of the mind, you could be put in a mental asylum. There were things that could be put, you could be put away. Here's a list of them. Does anyone recognize themselves in that? <laughs> You're lucky it's 2014, otherwise you'd be in a mental asylum. This is what got you put away. The future keeps on changing. 40 years ago, or probably just five years ago in Brussels, sorry, you can critique me later, uh, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And my Dubai friends say, none of us smoke camels, but that's a different question. <laughs> if you go back 10 years ago, when I was working in Victoria Health in Australia, they were very clear, the doctor will be female, the doctor will be migrant, and the doctor will meditate and prescribe it as evidence-based science. Again, a dramatic shift. If you go back two years ago, we we're working with Osri to develop a global spatiality where every city, every building has a wellness illness in index. So we know if you live in a place with fast food restaurants, you're more likely to get ill. As you go to the next 20 years, you get the 4P. Participate in your health, personalize, prevent, and predict. So the image of the future, the image of what counts as health is changing. Now our task is, of course, linking 2030 with 2014. If we're too far ahead, no one understands us. If we're just doing today's work, a management consultant can just, I mean, we have no purpose. A good AI system can replace the futures very easily. So it's making that link. So the problem for me is the world is changing, yes, in heterogeneous ways. It's different in Brussels and Karachi than Sydney. And how then do we get agency back? So the model I use is six pillars, which I won't go into today, but it's a way to logically, rationally think through and restore agency. So that's the imagination of futures. Now my question, of course, does it work? And so that's what I want to try to work with you. Does foresight work? And I'll present some case studies of does it or does it not work? In this case, the country wanted a knowledge revolution. And as we start to put computers in every classroom, we found more and more there was something called the used future. The factory, the school was modeled after the factory. As computers came in, they kept everyone in lovely rows like today's conference room. They were unable to think, how do we redesign space for new technologies? So we quickly found out the issue was not new technologies. That had zero influence on a knowledge revolution. The influence were the principals, the ministers who said, I'm in charge and rooms that were designed for non-interaction. So we had to change the story, moving from I'm in charge to we're all learners. We had to redesign rooms to include new ways of technologies, virtual Wii's, gaming, et cetera, to make it work for them. So this notion of the used future prevents us from moving forward. We, uh, in the Ministry of Health in Bangladesh, how do you bring in new technologies to empower local Bangladeshi females? So they're in charge of health. So we, the story was the flyover story. The challenge was when the minister got this report, he was unable to act on it. Even though it said hospitals is the used future, we don't want to go the Western route. Prevention, empowerment is the new future. He didn't want to go that route because his question was, how do I cut the ribbon on prevention? We had a new model, we had a new vision, we had the scenarios. How do I get credit if you're actually solving the problem, tomorrow's problem today, I won't get reelected. 
So we had to find a way where he got credit for solving tomorrow's problems today. So this is consistently the used future forces us into being dead. As Ibn Khaldun said, the 14th century, this is when the living are dead. So one way out is to start to look at, well, what's changing? So when we work with Europol, Interpol, and Hague, we find out the old method was drive your car madly. The new one is, okay, let's look for intelligence. Let's use data differently. So this is what we're doing at a global level, every year taking 20 deputy commissioners through a foresight process. Our goal is very clear. The commissioners can't act, but by 2025, over 300 deputy commissioners will have gone through futures. Many of them will be commissioners. You'll have a global capacity for foresight in policing. So this is taking the 15-year view seriously and actually developing capacity over 15 years. And of course, the world keeps on changing. Now, when is the right time to drink cola? Well, you have your own view for that. But this company asked three, four of us, should we still be in the cola business? Based on the data we saw was no. You'll be the tobacco merchants of 2030. You need to switch. Their conclusion was by 2030 to become a wellness company. This other company, based on this prevention, participation, personalization, they said, we're in the wrong business. We shouldn't be in insurance, we should be in health services navigation. So foresight for these companies gives them information where they change. With this trucking company, they said, oh my God, we have to get out of trucking into bioinformatics. Let's develop new technologies so we can make the world safer, so every truck driver, we get full information when they're getting sleepy. Now the challenge for that, the person head of trucking insurance, during the meeting at 4.30, he looked at me, he said, I thought you said this was going to be a fun day. I said, well, everyone's having fun. Yeah, but you guys just changed our core strategy. I said, well, do you want to be in the dying industry or the new industry? And that becomes always the tension. With the Singapore Ministry of Transport, they have the number one ranked infrastructure system in the world. And they said, we need to think about the future. I said, why? We can see by our straight trend analysis if we continue will be like Jakarta, and I apologize to Indonesians in the room, but you know Jakarta. So their conclusion was, let's use the rivers. Let's use buildings and develop pods that go up and down buildings. Let's use smart biosystems. The river thing was interesting, but there was a weakness. We did the scenarios, the scenarios were analytic, the weakness was very clear, which was Asians don't want to use rivers, that signified to poverty. So not only do we have to develop a new strategy, we have to find a new story in which the river gets exciting. So foresight is looking at information and saying, how do we change what's resisting? We're working with big NGOs and the same question, will NGOs still exist in 2030? World Vision, Caritas, etc. said, oh my God, maybe we won't. You can have direct person-to-person -person interaction through kiva.org. Why would you need big NGOs? NGOs, their money's running out, so one person said, let's do an IPO. If people really believe in caring, maybe they'll support us. The whole notion is, as you look for alternatives, you transform the policy and strategy. The mistake often is people use the shell two by two method, which only reinforces the present under the pretense of foresight. We did this with one steel company. I said, why do you want to do futures? They said, well, we miss the, we miss the economic rise of China. I said, how do you miss the economic rise of China? Where's your scanners? They said, yeah, you're right. So they did the normal two by two scenarios. Their conclusion was to be more environmentally friendly, which is beautiful. I called them two years later. I said, what was the result of your scenario workshop? They said it was a total failure. I said, why? I said, oh, we missed the GFC. So of course, it's not just the data or the scenarios, it's going deeper. And that's often saying, when is the right time to do this? I presented once to 550 mayors in a rural part of the world, and it was very clear from them, and I, for me, it was in a room like this, the more I spoke, the more they drank. By the end of dinner, half the room was totally drunk and screaming at me. Now, it could have been me, but then I realized from their point of view, they didn't want more information about the future. They were overwhelmed. One mayor said, my salary is $15,000 uh, a year. Why do I care about the future? My cities are being destroyed. No one lives there anymore. 
So the next morning when they woke up from being drunk, they offered to buy all my books. I said, well, let's work on your neocortex, let's work on your neocortex instead of your you know, reptilian brain. So when you're in a position of fear, the future's difficult. Your breathing is fast, you're looking for danger everywhere. You can't see the future properly. So we try to get people to think about foresight differently. But sometimes urgency can help. This is a project for one state in the world. The head of that state said, I will cut all budget to libraries. You have seven years before all budgeting is finished. So they sat through, what do we do differently? Scenario one is we die the slow death, the dinosaur death. Scenario two was, it's not about books, it's about people. How do we transform the library so we're not counting books loaned, we're counting people who come here? We change our metrics to warm bodies to workshops. Scenario three was no, let's go Oculus Rift, meaning full-on virtual technology. Students come in, they talk to Shakespeare, they talk to Khaldun, they talk to the giants in history. So they, it becomes an, a virtual place. And scenario four was they co-publish. In the Q&A, think about what might be a fifth scenario. This has changed their strategy, and for museums I work with as well, they're now thinking the old museums are dead, how do we rethink the museum? But there's a fifth scenario here that I've missed. If you can think of it, that would be great. The airport said, well, one airport we're working with, they said, we can see we're in a terribly vulnerable place. What's the future of airports? And one of their big scenarios was, it's not about the airport, it's about the destination. Another scenario was, let's become an airline. The one I liked the most was, we actually need to make it my airport. Every person has a direct experience with that airport, green, personalized. The minute they wake up, they have a total seamless experience from home to airport to destination. But the point is they're seeing how is the world changing and using that information to redevelop their culture and their strategy. In Malaysia, we've started the same process. And so the ministry has a very clear scenario called force feed. We will get the students what we think. The professors say, this is great. You ask students, they say, well, maybe not so much. The student scenario is a la carte. I will design my menu as a food court. Now this was too much for the ministry, so their alternative kind of integrated scenario is basically the nutritious buffet. Here's the alternatives of what you think is curriculum, and then you negotiate with the student. Now to make these scenarios real, I can promise you it doesn't happen in my experience with one paper to the minister. The first paper you do, the minister gets it, throws in the garbage. Year two, gets it, has his deputy throw in the garbage. Uh, year three, looks around for someone to throw in the garbage. Year four is where we're at. We've now taken 150, 160 deans and deputy vice chancellors through the futures process. They're owning it. They now are, and the goal is very much, this will take seven, eight years. We get a critical mass of deans, vice chancellors, they can then influence the deep culture. Because the culture is very clear, don't change. If I change, I won't get reelected. If I change, the parents will attack me. So error four is, of course, only assume one future. As futurists, our goal is always to be more adaptable. Now, where are you in the macro pattern? If you're doing foresight, you think you're doing well, we have a 10-year process in Malaysia, 10-year process with Europol, Interpol, et cetera, but there's things that change in the world. There's 100-year cycles, 500-year patterns, 1,000-year patterns. I try to get cities, countries, organizations to use them intelligently. For example, are you on a bullet train to the future? Or are you in a pendulum, centralized, decentralized? Or are you snakes and ladders? If we go up, we could quickly fall down. So getting organizations to get, are we in a complex adaptive system or a simple system? That becomes crucial. So I've seen many foresight projects work with one mayor. The new mayor comes in and says, I don't like soft systems. Give me Bob the Builder engineers. Let's just build. Who cares about culture? So it's then getting organizations ready. If there's a pendulum shift, how do you survive? With one city, it was all green engineers, green designers. The new mayor came in, changed the targets. Now what do we do? Choice one, commit suicide. Choice two, get depressed. Stay depressed for five years. Choice three, how do I protect my own green area given that there's been a political change? 
So this means sensitivity to macro history. So we look at games, something called the Sarkar game, for example, which we look at power and politics. In one biosecurity center, the scientists were all leaders in WHO, OIE, doing thing on, things on animal health. Every time they went to the minister, the minister would talk down to them. Finally, when we looked at macro history and power, I said, oh my God, he thinks I'm a toilet cleaner. And I apologize to toilet cleaners. And, I, and so his view of the scientists were, you're not relevant, you're talking science, I could care less. From the view of the scientists, his view is, I'm actually doing something very important for the world. I'm going to solve Ebola, solve SARS. So suddenly the realization that in the world of politics, they construct each other differently, they said, now we have to change our strategy. If that's how we see the world, we can denigrate the minister or we can think through, given his reality, how do we present foresight to make it accessible so he can be part of the transformation cycle. And to me, that's a better solution than one scientist at the end of a three-day workshop. What's the number one strategy? Is it scenarios? Is it biosecurity systems? Is it buffers? He said, no, let's kill the minister. I said, well, that's not going to work. You know, one, it's illegal. Two, that's not good use for science. So it's really thinking through deeply this. When we were working with Iqbal in Dubai on water futures, should they stay in water futures? They were very clever. The vision has to become real. They made sure that, in fact, the funders were in the room. What Vladimir was saying, they have to own the process. The funders, the people being impacted, they have to be there. So in that sense, the CEO was the champion, but the funders provided help there. Again, when we do city futures, we look at 2037, 2047. I had one architect say, we have to do 2047. I said, that's great, but that's far away. He said, it takes 40 years to redesign the skyline. I need 40 years, I need to start today. When we do city futures, again, get the citizens, deep participation, get the experts, and get the political leaders, and see if we can have some type of conversation, and sometimes we succeed really well. In one city, 10 years ago, they wanted light rail, green spaces. 2014, they have it. So again, you can see here are some successes. But in the journey of foresight, as all as you know, things can get tiring. It can be too much. I have to change everything, right? I have to, be, I have to create a new renaissance. Well, that's a lot for these 200 people to do, to create a new renaissance. So then we do backcasting, as many of you know. So I don't ask organizations to do everything. What are three simple things we can do in the next 10 years? Just three. We focus our resources, our money, our assets on that. So that takes away from being overwhelming. Three different things, including how do we, how do we change our culture? So the error six is the vision is not linked to funding. The vision is not held by the champion. The vision is not connected to the metaphor, and the vision is not linked to, to backcasting. So that's a big mistake we, we make often. Now, error seven, if you've seen my CLA work, it's very clear. You have to link story to strategy. So my experience is culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, if you like your breakfast, that may be okay. But if you want more than breakfast, then you have to find a way to make it real. If you've seen this slide before, why, do, why are metaphors powerful? In this one study, duplicated many times, same data on criminality in your neighborhood. Group one, the metaphor they use is crime is a beast. Policy recommendation, put money in policing. Group two, the metaphor was crime is a virus. Policy recommendation, put money in education, ending poverty. So the metaphor you use has direct correlation to the policy and strategy. And the metaphors also tell you why the strategy will fail. So often with ministries, the, the number one story that comes out is, we're in Camelot, but there's hungry wolves everywhere. And so meaning it's a risky environment, I may lose my job, the press may not like me. So our strategy then is, how do we make it safer for you? Do you blow up the castle? As my Europol friends say, send the detective out to the wolves, uh, find the head wolf and kill them, that solves the problem? Or is it, do you find other ways to negotiate? With policing groups, they often say, we feel like we're in a Colosseum, in a Roman Colosseum, and we're the Christians, and the lions are criminals getting faster and dangerous, and the citizens are watching. 
They seem powerful from the outside. From the inside, they feel very vulnerable. What do you do? Do you bring the citizens into your coliseum? Do you train the lions? Or as one person said, no, police need to become atheists. Stop believing you're so special. So there's always a narrative shift which helps the strategy. The shift we've worked on is going from the knight holding the sword to a director in the orchestra, or maybe a member of the orchestra. So once you change the story, you can change the strategy. With the librarians, we change from keeper of the collection to innovator of the gardens. The gardens are all the new technologies, the new spaces. How do we do things differently? Now, this is an important example. This was a, currently a steel company. Their challenge between production of steel and the story of the leaking oil tanker. And this is common throughout the world. So as you start to think through, given information about climate change, Chinese steel production, new types of materials, where do you want to put your effort? Now, even if the CEO or the management says, we want to put our effort into new materials, dealing with climate change sensitive solutions, there was the inner story called, I felt, the men of steel. Traditional managers who were vested in the last 50 years. So we had to find a new story that wasn't too threatening. In this case, it was Optimus Prime. Has anyone seen the movie Transformers? Or you don't want to admit you have? OK, so most of you have, but would never admit in a public space like this. Fair enough. So that's the notion. It's a steel car that transforms and becomes adaptable, can read the changing signals of the future, and can act with dynamism. So that becomes their new story to start to think about what could new technologies where you have new type of roofs that have solar panels built into the paint. So you start to explore there. In the Singapore example, they move from the car being the center to the person being the center. So everything is within reach of the person. That becomes a story from which you design either transport hubs or new types of boats or new types of systems. Also in their example, you start to collect data on what does everyone, what do the citizens want in the future? What are their new stories? What are their new strategies? We've run this at the, at the civilizational level as well. In Asia, for example, there's a narrative switch from the rule of the big man, the feudal system, to the fresh food market more inclusive. Now, of course, there's contending stories, there's stories in struggle with each other, but these stories point us to here's a new possible future. Here's how things could change. So the seventh error is we focus on Bob the Builder. We, don't, we think that we can engineer the future. Instead, as I'm suggesting, culture is foundational to it. So knowing the culture story is crucial. Now, once you start this process, but you have to find someone to work with. Again, as Vladimir said, here's, five, here's a few hundred foresight experts. So you have to find who are the carriers of the infection. So I always look for the 10%. This is work we did with Fuji Xerox. Who are the 10% who get the virus? You work with them. Then you find the 30% who are carriers of infection. They continue the virus. Those of you in HR, you know 30% actually don't want to innovate. They want to make sure the future is stable. They're full of personal anxiety, job anxiety. They're full of fear. So that 30%, you want to make them feel safe as you disrupt. Now, there is 10% who feel like this. And all of us get those all the time, whether it's a speech, a workshop. There's 10%, whatever you say, they're going to say the opposite. Doesn't matter what you say. They come to a conference, to a workshop, just to say the opposite. What do you do with them? Them you honor. Yes, you're right. The opposite is also true. We're all Hegelian. And you can be in charge of the opposite. We're in charge of the disruption. So it's quarantining as you move forward. And to me, again, the, one of the biggest learning is including everyone. When we do this with justice systems, it's a challenge. A chief justice once said to me, OK, I want to bring the prisoners in the room, but how do I get security for my judges? We know we need prisoners to have a robust scenario workshop on the future of crime, right? It won't work otherwise. But how do I do that? At one meeting, we were looking at the futures of disability. The minister was clever. He said, everyone has to be in the room. 
So we had 550 people with multiple disabilities, intellectual to physical, working in the room, and that created a huge dynamic where people felt included. There was a protest outside the hotel, and we just invited them in. So again, as Vladimir said, deep inclusion and foresight processes work. Now, even in that meeting, some of you have heard the story, at the end, we came up with our vision, our scenarios on physical disability, and someone from the intellectual disability field, he stood up and said, well, actually, I don't share that vision. I don't even like people with intellectual disability, uh, physical disability. And now we think, oh my God, we just ruined three days of work. The entire thing we built is destroyed. But at that moment, the entire room started to clap. I thought, oh my God, they're clapping even though he's excluded them. And they were clapping because they were used to being excluded in our society that focuses on the abled. So then as they clapped, he started to scream because the clapping gave him social anxiety. At that moment, 550 people in real time stopped clapping and started signing. And then I said to the head of the disability council who was visually impaired, they're signing. He says, don't worry, we can figure it out. So my learning was because they're used to being discriminated against, they had developed multiple perspectives on the future and were far more adaptable than those of us who were officially abled. So again, the error is only include the experts, only include the, the strategist, and of course, most boards only include people that look like them. And more we know if we want to be robust in a global economy, include the difference in ways that can make sense. So for me, here's what works. You, know, you challenge the used future, and that's often the de facto future we have to push against it by assumptions. Second, it's very much, how is the world changing? What are the weak signals, the emerging issues? Third, don't do this when things are hell, because then you're going, going to the reptilian brain. Fourth, of course, always have the scenarios. Find the pattern. Will the scenario still work in 20 years, 10 years? Six, make the vision real, personalize it. I ask CEOs to close their eyes. If a vision statement is not a statement. They're imagining themselves with their eyes closed in 2025. What are they doing that day? It has to be viscerally real. And link the story to strategy, otherwise it's cultural leader up. And as you engage, find the change agents. And finally, make sure everyone's in the room. Now ultimately, there's one view of life that says very clearly, the grass is greener on the other side. My learning from foresight, the grass is greener where you water it. So you do what works, you find it, it's a learning journey, and you keep on doing it, and we keep on learning from it. And I hope lots of success in your foresight efforts. Thank you.